A lot of ladies have to. I got my licence in 1989. Studied at the Wallace Institute when it was at St Leonard's and did exams at Macquarie University with very, very, very strict supervision. Seen a few people being thrown out and asked for identification and they couldn't provide it. Uh, my great interest is having been born in Karingai, always very interested in Karingai, hence the interest in the very first wireless message from the United Kingdom to Australia, which is and was an absolute fluke. I've looked into what the propagation was like at the time and all that sort of thing. My voice is a bit funny because I've already given one talk today this morning. Mm. Uh, but it's very, very interesting that we should have these so many people as the early experimentalists. And I'm just going to move on to the three. Are you going to leave all the lights on? Or? Yeah, well, we would, uh, that'll come you on can fine. See it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it good. Yep. The three early. I might even sit down. You can. Yeah. <laughs> Friendly. Not as comfy as those couches, but no. Well, we could move. There's more comfortable one behind you. There is. There yeah, is that one. Right. This is alright. <laughs> this is alright. So the three men I'm going to talk to you about are Billy Hughes, Marconi, and Ernest Fisk. Now you all know who those three people represent, I'm sure. Uh, but we'll move on and we'll talk about each and every one of them. Uh, Billy Hughes, born in 1862, in London. Everyone said he says that he's born in Wales, but he was not. He was a Welsh extraction, but he was born in London. And he grew up in Wales. He migrated to Australia and disappeared into the wandering life as an unskilled worker. This is all to give you your children and grandchildren hope. <laughs> this whole lecture about these three people. He was an unskilled worker and he came back into Sydney as a shopkeeper, odd job man and an umbrella member. But where did he end up? Prime Minister of Australia. He became interested in politics and we're not going to talk politics, we've got better things to talk about. But he died at Linfield in 1952. Now, Guglielmo Marconi was born 10 years later, on the 25th of April, but not on Anzac Day. And his mother, fortunately for him, was Annie Jamison, of the Jamison Irish Whiskey. And that is how Marconi grew up bilingual. And that made all the difference to him. If he had not been bilingual, he would never have made the grade because his father, the Italian, was not interested. The Italian government were not interested in what he was doing, but his mother was pushy. Now, he could not pass an exam. He couldn't get into university. More hope for the grandchildren. <laughs> and uh, there he is with his mother and his brother. He's the little fella. 1895, we commemorated that here, the very first transmission. And you can see, if you look very carefully, I don't know whether you can see, but the gardener's down there, and oh, he's just transmitting from here down to the gardener, and the gardener's waving to say yes, yes, and flapping something. And that was in Italy, of course. Now his father, he had a barn with all his equipment in it and his father got sick of all that and threw it all out. But there's the sort of equipment that he used in 1895 for that. A little bit older than what you're currently using to speak to the Barrow Islands. 1896, because the Italian people were not interested, his mother decided to take him to England, which she did, with a, a letter uh, for the GPO and so forth. 
Now, in 1901, the first signals crossed the Atlantic from cold earth in Cornwall. I don't know whether any of you have been to the Marconi station down there, the old Marconi station. It's a, if you get a chance to go down to Cornwall, please go and find out where the Cornish and the radio club is <coughs> because they're very, very pleasant people. And you can see where all the old masts were there and where Marconi set up shop. That was his first. Now, in 1905, he married the Honourable Beatrice O'Brien, keeping the Irish in the family. And in 1924, the marriage was annulled and he was able to marry an Italian girl. A lot of people can't work that out, that the Pope annulled his marriage. In 1930, he had a daughter, Maria Elettra. Elettra was, Elettra was his favourite name. And his daughter was Princess, known as Princess Elettra later. He delivered a lecture at the, the Royal Academy where he got the Nobel Prize. And if any of you are interested, here is a copy of it, where we have all the old equipment and etc. That was given to me, and that was quite interesting, by the um, Italian consul. Because one year here, commemorating the opening of the uh, 1923 wireless exhibition, they had Marconi's signature, which I'll show you in a moment, across the sails of the Opera House. Mm -hmm. And we organised quite a number of ham radio operators to go in and meet the Italian consul. It was good. So there's the book that I'm about to show you. But you can have a look at it. I'm not going to fiddle around. There's his signature that showed on the Opera House sales one evening. 1909, so I think it was 2009. Anyway, this is the sort of thing, just imagine. Just imagine using equipment like this. And I'm very quickly. There is Uncle Sam in Britannia saying thank you to Mr. Marconi after the Titanic disaster. Now we're talking about that's where this first message came from, this little place called Winefowl. I think you're sort of aware there's Anglesey Island there, and Carnarvon's just there. Hanging in a bit further. And there's the specifications. Now that's what the station looked like in 1914 and that's what it looked like in 2004. <coughs> and there it is in all its glory when the message was sent in 1918. Ten masts made by the shipbuilders around, Welsh shipbuilders. Very good for building masks. Here's the base of one of the masks. pretty serious. Yeah. Not even five of them. There were ten here. There's your wavelengths, etc., and the specifications of the transmitter. Pictures of the transmitters here. Huge, absolutely huge. But there's Marconi later on. Now he died in 1937. He was only 63 and he was to come to Australia in 1938, but he didn't ever make it. Now Ernest Fisk, another good story. He couldn't pass an exam either. He was born in England and he left school to work in a factory and then he moved to a railway station bookstore and then he became interested in Morse code and then he joined the post office. And he joined the Marconi company and he came to Australia, Marconi sent him to Australia <coughs> and as you know, he was knighted for his work and he was the head of AWA and lived at Warunga where the message was received. And he died in Lingfield as well, because he moved. Actually, the house where he lived 
is where there is a, this monument, which I'll show you in a moment. And the people who bought it, the house from him, <coughs> if, if they said where they lived, people would say, oh, you live in Fisk's house. And she'd say, no, Fisk was only there for four years. We've been there 40. <laughs> so, now, Fisk was a really odd character. He was a theosophist, a truth seeker. And he imagined that it didn't matter what you sent out by waves into the ether, as long as there was someone out there to be able to receive it, we'd just keep on rolling around. And he was really, look, this is the sort of thing. They signed off at him just either. so much, poor old Fisk. <laughs> yeah, really. So was he involved with 2GB, the foundation of 2GB? That's correct. That's, well, that was the Theosophist yeah. station. That's correct. And there he is. Now, there's his house in Warunga in 1918. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that gorgeous? I've got some of those. I collect insulators. See, some people collect teddy bears, but I collect the insulators. <laughs> now, in 1911, the first Karingai wireless operator was Henri Laveria, and he had been the radio operator with Mollison. He had did Gordon, and uh, as you can see, he's a French extraction. Seven other people, and I'm not going into them, but uh, lived in and around. Now, the link between Hughes, Marconi and Fisk occurred in 1918. Prime Minister Hughes had communication concerns during the wartime. You all know why? The only communication between Australia and the rest of the world was what? The Oceanic cable. cable. Anyone cut that off? Australia would have no communication at all. That, they had the Overland Telegraph, of course, that plaques from Alice Springs. <coughs> that was all right, but it had to go somewhere mm. to get out to the rest of the world. So here he is visiting the troops in France in 1918. And it was on the 22nd of September in 1918 that the very first direct wireless message from Great Britain to Australia, from Wales to Urunga. Now the Welsh people aren't very happy because the plaque that was put on the monument says from England. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether any of you have Welsh extraction, but ah, oh, I'll call them. Oh, good. Well, Welshmen are very Welsh. There's the specifications. I'll just let you read that one. <laughs> As I said, it was, it was a fluke. That was a kilowatt. So you have 10 masts, 4 in 300 metres. It's a small angle, maybe a group, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Only Jeez. 200 kilowatts. Yes. Yeah, it's quite a... And of course, a lot of people think it was two-way and it wasn't. It was just a one-way message. There's the station and what it looked like in 1918. There it is from a distance. And there's the station at Wurunga. Now, you can roughly see that there were two masts. You can see that there, you can still see the base at uh, the, the back of the house. But that's, that's the best picture we could get. And I don't like to paint shop it. It's not history anymore. And the other one was three doors down. That's the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> e <-T> -V -I. <laughs> but it's lovely to see that. And of course, on this corner, you'll see where the monument now is. There's a better picture of uh, one of the masts. Oh, the the mask. Mask. <laughs> Wouldn't you love that in the backyard? <laughs> well, well, the, the, the uh, stand is still there. It's a flagpole. The yeah, first extra, one. Extra points for that. <laughs> Now, there you are, all the Welshmen. What does that say? Two more beef patties special. That's what it says. 
And it really was an incredible thing to happen. And there QSL it, card. That's the QSL card, that's right. <laughs> that's the QSL card, I've got some here. Actually, um, that has, the original of that has these photos affixed to it and it goes with the house. It's in the house and it's part of the uh, story, yeah. It passes on to the next people. And he said, I have just returned from a visit to the battlefields where the glorious valour and dash of the Australian troops saved in the end and forced back the legions of the enemy. It was a propaganda message. Send more fodder. <laughs> That's what it was all about. There are the four people. Joseph Cook was the uh, Prime Minister prior to Billy Hughes. And in this, at this time, he was the Minister for the Navy. Now, Marconi, of course, had quite an ego. Shakespeare said, I'll put a girdle around the earth in 40 minutes. Marconi said, I'll do it in one fifteenth part of a second. <laughs> Clubs started to appear in the area of Kuringai. Uh, Kalara Radio Club, Linfield Radio Club, Metropolitan Radio Club, Northern Suburbs, Wurunga. I'm really not going to spend a lot of time on that. But this is the house where the message was received. And this is a depiction of the uh, equipment out in the garden. And people think that it was received out in the garden. It was not. It was received in an attic room and the cables and wires and so forth are still there. And there are his sons listening to the wireless on the veranda. And this is Marconi's yacht. Dear little thing, isn't it? It's called Electra. <laughs> He sent a message from there to turn the lights on for the wireless exhibition. And that's why there's a bust of Marconi in the town hall here, Sydney Town Hall, mm -hmm. and a Marconi room. There's the station that was inside the yacht. A little bit bigger, I think, than the one on the side <laughs> of the Switched on 2,800 lights with a signal. 1934-35, here we have Fisk and Hughes and they decided that there would be a monument. Mercury. There's Mercury, commonly known to all the Sigs as Jimmy. Mercury, the messenger of the gods. Here's where they built the, the wall and got ready for it all to happen. And there it is in all its glory in the early days. The monument at Lucania, that's the name of the house. And that's the name of the ship that uh, Fisk came to Australia on. First direct message from England. See, from England. Huh. Welshman, you don't have to read it. The unveiling ceremony on the 14th of December. Ladies and gentlemen, our Australian friends, it gives me the that is Mark Tony's voice coming from his yacht. Some part in your ceremony today, after nearly 20 years since I directed the transmissions from the high-powered station at Kalaman, which resulted in the conveyance of the first direct wireless telegraph message to reach Australia from England and Europe. Over a considerable period, in fact, since the closing years of the last century, I have served and the world improved and cheaper means of communication by electrical transmissions through space. Not a little of this time had been devoted to the development of systems which would afford mariners a surer and safer aid to navigation and thereby a larger measure of safety and security for the passengers who travelled with them. My work in the course of navigators on sea and in the air is not yet finished. It is natural 
I should also have devoted considerable time and research to methods which would bring distant countries of the world into closer and more intimate touch with one another. Actually, I've only ever played it through, and that was the Hornsby Radio Club. <laughs> and usually, I just let people hear his voice because have any of you ever heard his voice before? No, no, no. It's pretty rare, so, and but you can hear that he's uh, <coughs> he's got a pretty good accent, really, yeah. considering yeah. no well. Irish there. <laughs> there were crowds and crowds of people at the unveiling. Now, Marconi died in 1937, as I said, when he was 63 years old in Italy. Hughes died aged 90 in Linfield, and Fisk died in Roseville. I did say Linfield before, but he died in Roseville. He was really a character. He, he used to ride a push bike everywhere, all around Coringa, and he got a car, and uh, the car was put in this, had a garage built for it and everything else, and he drove it for a few months, and then he made the decision that he'd sooner be on his push bike, so the car went out of the garage, and the push bike went into the, <coughs> into the garage, and he kept on riding. Now, 1935 to 1984, the monument stood with Mercury taking the occasional flight. <laughs> It was quite a thing. During this time, the wing god, uh, well, it disappeared. They put a pole up. They made some replicas out of some sort of plastic material. Uh, first of all, just the plastic ones, they all disappeared. So they put a pole up the middle of it, and then it was only just a bigger challenge. It was found, the original, was found up in the Atherton Tablelands. We were done. And it wasn't until just recently I was talking to someone and he said that he thinks that the RAF boys from Bradfield stole it during World War II. And they were moved up to the Atherton Tablelands to a base up there and he, they think that they pinched it on the way up. Anyway, it, it, it now lives in the council chambers, the original the monument has nothing on it. It lives in the council chambers of Kuringai. Uh, and on the 22nd of September, early in the morning, the councilman comes and puts it back up for us onto the monument. And we stand there, the historical society, before we did form a club of amateurs and they used to always be there. And um, he, he's down there 
And then at night time, we take him down and he usually sleeps at my place for the night and the council man comes and collects him the next day. Mm -hmm. Now this is the Dragon Radio Club. And on that day, oh, I'll show you that first. That's so the, you've actually slept with Mark Haney? No, the Mercury. Who, Jimmy? Oh, Mercury. <laughs> 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 no, 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 no. Not Mark Haney, with, with Mercury. <laughs> Messenger of the Gods. Uh, this is their, the radio club there. They are so keen because they go into the transmission station on that 22nd of September every year. Some of you may have heard them. And uh, we had at the house all the local school kids for the 75th anniversary, Knox and everyone else and this and so forth. We'll move on a bit there. The leaflet handed out for everyone attending. And we formed a radio club, VK2WAH for Warunga for the 75th anniversary. And they had GB2BK. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked VK2GB if, and I asked permission of the um, department first, and he wouldn't let us use it. Oh, 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 spoil, spoil. Oh, 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 oh. What a spoil, spoil. He wouldn't spoil. believe it, would you? Yeah. You just wouldn't believe it. Anyway, you can see that. Now, there's the transmission station. And there they are with Crad. Now Crad is the uh, mascot for the Dragon Radio Club over there. And they sent me one of these to have in the early days. When I went and took a replica monument, they gave me this one. <laughs> so I felt rather flattered. So we have these up at the monument, the kangaroo with the Welsh flag and the dragon with the Aussie flag, but there's a doctor there and he's quite convinced that these two are related. <laughs> he said there's definitely a relationship <laughs> in the backbones. <laughs> here they are talking to us and we made contact on the day, the first time, that 75th anniversary, we made contact. And the Carnarvon Herald said, hello, Wurunga, we're back again after 75 years. Now, I'm just a little bit of Weissen in interspersed here. I don't know, are any of you with Weissen? You've got a few Weissen members, right? A couple of Weissen members. Well, this gentleman is John Howard, who was one of the first people to start police radio. When you introduce him, he always says, not from Benelong. <laughs> But he was head of Weissen at one stage. And I'd just like to tell you, I believe Dick Smith came to talk to you. Well, I paid mission control for him over at Terry Hills when he was in his balloon from Western Australia to Tabulac. And he asked me if I would do the next one from New Zealand back here. 94 bushfires is my radio room. There's Barry. Now. I was talking about Barry, Barry White. Mm. Uh, all the repeaters were burnt out and we kept this going 24 hours a day. 95, BK2 IMD, International Marconi Day. They it's asked us... Hmm? In a modulation distortion. With this, with, with this, with this spark out. Was right, kill it right. I had the one at 200k for that day. Um, oh yes, there's one. There's an original one. We, they asked us because we were the only place in Australia that Marconi had touched, apart mm. from the town hall. So they, the International Marconi Day people asked us if we would join. It all seems to have gone by the board, mind you. It gets activated every year by Haddock before someone. Is it? Yeah. Still, good, yeah. good. 97, I had a replica made of Jimmy on a, on a plinth of New South Wales timber, green doors only, and I didn't have written on it from Wales to Warunga, from 
England to Warunga, but I had it from Wales to Warunga. And that was, I took that over or I sent it over. And there we are with our replica talking to the other one behind us. And we went over and there we are over in Anglesey with the replica and with all the mares and they seem to have a mare in there. Oh, well, I suppose it's not that far, but every couple of miles you get another mare out of there. <laughs> and we had um, a, a couple of local mayors and the Australian High Commission and everyone else. And there's, in 97, what the radio, uh, the uh, transmission station looks like, looked like. And there's inside where the equipment was. And there's Mercury being unveiled. That's when they gave me crab. And there's Fisk's son and daughter-in-law and grandson and great-granddaughter. They all came out there for that mm -hmm. special day. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to take you on a few side tracks. We're saying goodbye to Australia. Four of us left here and to, to go over there. Destination, Wainfara and Carnarvon. Plenty of Welsh lambs, as you know. And we went past <laughs> this, we couldn't believe it. <laughs> so naturally we had to stop and go in and see what the Australian arms were like. We had a bit of a problem with their Welsh spelling. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they drew maps for us to make sure we knew which way and how we were to get there, but they drew all their maps from where they, from their place back rather than from where we were coming and heading to. Oh, there's Paul. There you are. There's Push and there's Paul. Yeah. <laughs> this is just typical Welsh countryside. This was a lovely place. We had a lunch. <laughs> Pretty place, terrible food, impossible name. Try and pronounce that. The Welshmen tell you that it's a very easy language to learn. You just say it as it's spelled. <laughs> we asked if we could go to a concert to hear some Welsh choirs or something, and they couldn't organise it for the time, or there wasn't one on. But we felt we were privileged because we went to a rehearsal. And that was so much better because we spoke to all the Welsh people and it was just lovely. Uh, it's the only surviving Marconi station in the British Isles and it's now used as a community centre. And it's up that laneway and there it is. And that's one of the climbing walls. <laughs> it, it's privately owned and it is used when Snowdonia is impossible and they practice their climbing, rock climbing and everything. These walls are just huge. There it is looking from the back and you can see the water in the background where the boat builders came from. You can see, uh, by the way, the Welsh people who came up to see that opening, they had no idea what the masts had been there, except for one lady whose grandfather had been killed falling off a mast. <laughs> There's a bit of a, an aerial base just there. But the water, the takeoff, fantastic. There you are, there's an aerial mast, uh, flint. That's the local mayor there. Now there's a Friends of Marconi Museum, which has now been put together since I took that replica monument over. They wanted somewhere to really house it. It was in the Carnarvon Council Chambers for quite a while. And there's Princess Marconi, Electra, visiting. And there's the Not replica sure. monument in the middle. There she is. <coughs> Carnarvon Castle. Council chambers there. We also, in 2004, had this one. We were all given the keys of the castle and, oh, it's Quite a, quite a day. Mm -hmm. We all sat in Charlie's chair, actually. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there were four of us there from the Historical Society, and that's where the Queen goes to wave. Nobody waved back, unfortunately. 
This is just a typical scene. And that's a slate. Wonderful there for genealogy, you know, all the graves, all, all the headstones are made from slate and they don't wear out. Fantastic. But you can see there's slate piles everywhere. There's some people just there to give you some idea. And we headed from Wales. It's a lovely little island with a church on it. You can walk over in low tide. The bridge to Anglesey. The Menai Straits. There's the Marcus. And we went to the station, of course, on Anglesey, as one must do. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> just as it's written. Yeah, yeah you just say it the way it's written. I know it had to go to at the end, and that's about it. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? But then it tells you what it is. And I'm not going to dwell on that. Now, we went from Holyhead over to Ireland. And you recognise Fitzgerald's mind. pub from Valley Kiss Angel, I'm sure. And we went to the Jamison Whiskey Factory. Mm -hmm. Because I had heard that on the wall is a family tree. <laughs> and that mentions Marconi on it. What about Marconi, the Tito Jamison? No, Jamison, oh, yeah. Marconi's yeah. mother. That's correct. That is absolutely <laughs> correct. Now I'm going to just have a few Dublin. Do you all know who that is? Yeah. You know what the Irish people call it? The tart with the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's apparently another one that I missed out on someone bathing and they call it the floozy and the jacuzzi <laughs> so if Funny you're going that. to Dublin try and find the, jacu uh, the floozy and the jacuzzi because I wanted to go with this one <laughs> it's funny how the boobs are shiny because everybody rubs them <laughs> I've heard that too <laughs> well, I to, my wife refused to let me <laughs> <laughs> but I honestly think this one's important no. <laughs> Don't you all earnestly think it's important? <laughs> it's Oscar Wilde. Yeah, yeah. The importance of being earnest. Yeah, yeah. And there's the uh, Bernardo statue. Now, the National Library of Ireland, Joan would be the only person who could have seen this. I went back specially to take photos here because I've never seen anything quite like it. These are the ladies' toilets. I mean, they're not the toilets. This is the toilet room. <laughs> <laughs> this is the toilet room. It's a very strange model. It, it was just amazing. In the library, there it is. Yeah. Talking of comfortable seats. Yeah. Yeah. And here we are coming back to us. <laughs> Central Australia. <laughs> back, back home. And on the 22nd of September, back to the monument. <clears throat> and back to the house. Right. And there's Mercury being put up by the council now. There he is in all his glory. And there are the four of us that have been over here, over there in Wales. <laughs> and that's what it looks like on the 22nd of September every year. Only kangaroos on one side and the flags. We've got, we mastered the way of having the flags so they really show up. And that's the original message from the house, leaning against it. There it is there. There's some of the members of the Hornsby Radio Club. We had another visitor who came. A little bit of a display. There's 2007. And thank you for asking me, but are there any questions? But I want... I, I, don't ask me a question. I want to tell you something about ham radio and how I had a, a, a group on talking about genealogy. I teach family history and I'm very interested in it. And we had quite a group there and there was this New Zealander who was asking if I could find out some information about his great-grandmother. And 
Uh, I just wrote down a couple of things and I discovered that his great grandmother was a convict who went to Tasmania. And so I had all the information for him and I read it to him the next net. And I said, now, do you want to know what the book was that I found all this information in? I said, it's called Notorious Strumpets and Dangerous Girls. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said well, I'm an, Angli I'm an Anglican minister. I'll tell them about that from the pulpit on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was just gorgeous. So he was very happy to know that his great-grandmother had been a notorious strumpet. <laughs> All right, now, if there are any questions, I will try and answer them for you. Yes? You said that Marconi and Fisk couldn't pass an exam. That's correct. Do you know why? Well, can you imagine that they they were not dyslectic or anything like that? Okay, no, well, that was what that was the first thing that came to mind. Yes, I thought it might have been. I'm extremely I'm dyslexic. Ah, right. Well, they were not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they just didn't have the aptitude. Right. I mean, they made their way so well, and it gives a lot of hope to a lot of people. Uh, and Hughes was an umbrella man, and look where he got. Any plans for the 100th anniversary? <laughs> what was that? Are there any plans for the 100th anniversary? Oh, yes, I'm definitely. Uh, I'm going to take on some apprentices because I'm a bit frightened I mightn't be here. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure it will happen, and I've been talking to the local member and all that sort of thing. Actually, on his Facebook, he happened to be driving past and he stopped, and his pictures of last 22nd of September on his Facebook page, that's uh, Alistair Henscombe's. And I had to correct it because he said that it was a two-way, fortunately I looked at it the first day it went out. It wasn't a what, it was, oh, I don't remember. Well, it was two ways, one way by wireless, the other way by cable. No, 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 it was only no, a one-way one message. Cable. No, they didn't have any, they didn't have any facilities at Warunga to, answer it. They were just receiving. That's all they were doing. Another interesting thing that happened in Warunga really uh, was that they were going to move the Sydney Observatory to Warunga at one stage because of the smog in the city. Hmm. And F. Basil Cook was the um, head and his son was the head of the radio department of David Jones. And his son was the only person that was able to hold a licence uh, because they had to get time signals through. When, when all the other licences were taken during war from everyone, he was Basil Cook, the son, was able to keep his licence. Mm. Wow. Um, I have here a leaflet for everyone about the... Uh, I have... you to look at. IMD cards, WAH cards, I should put them out. They're all sponsored cards. I was able to get sponsorship from AWA and so forth to do all of these things. Here's my own card. With my koalas on. You don't operate anymore? No. I got myself too involved with too many other things on the bike. There's a leaflet. That's what we handed out to everyone that was there on the 75th. Leaflet all about it. I haven't got enough of those to let you have one of the each. Uh, this is the book that was printed for the monument opening. They were just scattered around. But this is the book that was printed for that occasion. And I was delighted when I was able to acquire that Marconi recording because I'd heard it once, but I was able to acquire it. But this is a limited edition for when they opened the uh, monument. There aren't very many monuments around, are there really? I mean, there's plenty of war memorials. The Marconi Club asked me if I'd write articles about Marconi for their magazine and I 
one in here and one in the next edition. This is the Marconi prospectus for the Marconi School. Another one that comes through every now and again. So feel free, they're the scrapbooks from all those occasions. So please feel free to help yourselves to these and have a look at anything else that's on the table. So this is a recording of Mark Handy. When, when did that happen? 1935. 1935. That was actually, he opened the monument, I was. I guess it was just after the Great Depression? Yeah. Mm. That's right. My grandfather was there, actually, I believe. Hmm. So, any other questions? No. No. Thanks very much, Joe. That was very interesting. <clears throat> Good. Thank you.